The Allies used them for the first time during the landings in Normandy, the duplex drive tanks. Duplex drives weren't traditional armored fighting vehicles. This particular kind of tank was a Sherman tank tweaked to float on water thanks to a canvas flotation screen around the vehicle. Thanks to two propellers, the tank engine was able to drive in the water. Because of its peculiar characteristics and abilities, a DD tank was nicknamed the Donald Duck. It's pretty spectacular, to be honest. The amphibious tank played a crucial role in the landings on the beaches of Normandy. Soldiers basically built their Sherman tank into a floating craft, making it much easier to land on the shores and to cover infantry landing among the vehicles. There was one man that stood at the helm of developing these Donald Ducks. And they certainly weren't his only inventions, eagerly utilized by the Allies during the Second World War. General Percy Hubbard specifically designed these floating tanks for Operation Overlord, the landings on Normandy in June 1944. They supported the troops storming the beaches of Normandy, vulnerable to German machine gun and artillery fire. During the landings on the beaches of Normandy, the most curious vehicle saw the light of day. Together with his specialist 79th Armored Division, General Hubbard took part in the preparations for D-Day. Hubbard developed more unusual-looking specialist armored fighting vehicles. The duplex drive tank was just part of a much larger contingent of special vehicles. Because of their looks, these vehicles were referred to as Hubbard's Funnies. Before we get to about a dozen of Hubbard's Funnies, I'll explain a little bit about the men behind these curious vehicles. Hubbard, nicknamed Hobo, was a British Major General and brother-in-law of Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery. He married Hubbard's sister, Elizabeth. Born in Nainital, India, he studied at Clifton College and at the age of 19 graduated from the Woolwich Royal Military Academy. Following his graduation, he joined the Royal Corps of Royal Engineers, commonly known as the Sappers, and was stationed in India. Their task was to provide military engineering and other technical support to the British Armed Forces. And, well, Hubbard certainly had some unique and creative ideas, but as we'll see, they certainly didn't serve him well, and his superiors weren't too impressed with his imagination. During the First World War, he fought both in France with the first Bengal sappers and in the Middle East, current-day Iraq. He held multiple positions after the war ended, steadily rising through the ranks. He ended the war as a temporary major, and by December 1937, he was a major general. Within this capacity, he was tasked with reforming and training the newly established mobile force. Consisting of four armored regiments, the force was redesignated the 7th Armored Division during the Second World War, also known as the Desert Rats. But initially, Hubbard wasn't even present or even in service when the division saw action in North Africa for the first time. The army forced him to retire in 1914. Sources indicate this was because of his unusual convictions about mechanized warfare and its potential and possibilities. Basically, Hubbard's superiors considered him a bit of a nuisance and antagonistic character. A wake-up call to the British command that an amphibious landing on the French coast would be a meat grinder without adequate armored support came in August 1942. It followed the disastrous Dieppe raid. Basically, the raid was an amphibious landing with massive Allied casualties. In retrospect, the British commanders concluded that, among other things, due to the lack of reliable armored support, within 10 hours of the beginning of the raid, over 60% of all soldiers that landed near the German-occupied French port of Dieppe were either killed, wounded, or captured. As such, the British decided to develop tanks that could reach the coast shore by themselves, instead of having them dropped off by landing vessels. After the British military historian and theorist B. H. Little Hart advocated for Hubbard's cause to Winston Churchill, he in turn reinstated him. Ironically, Hart really influenced pre-war German mechanized warfare as well. Hubbard re-entered service, became the commander of an armored division, and didn't suddenly start designing his dozens of funnies in the remaining years of the war. Instead, most of his funnies plans already existed thanks to developments during or right after the First World War. Concept plans for amphibian tanks or tanks with plows or rake-like structures to neutralize mines already existed. When he rejoined service, Hubbard simply began collecting, expanding and integrating these curious vehicles in order for them to become operational. We've already had a look at the Donald Duck or duplex drive tanks. The Hungarian-born Miklos Strausler created the initial designs which eventually allowed for the creation of the DD tank. 
it is undoubtedly the most famous funny, and perhaps you recognized it when I introduced the swimming vehicle in this video. Basically, an American Sherman M4 tank rotated its turret 180 degrees upon which the tank screw inflated the foldable flotation screen surrounding the tank. The rotating of the turret was necessary to maintain balance in the water. As the footage shows, after inflating the canvas, the four walls, if you will, remained above the surface of the water. 36 vertical inflatable rubber ribs held it up. Thanks to its two propellers, its top speed was around 7 km per hour, so approximately the same as a marching soldier. Except it was in the water, and it was a heavy floating tank. Allies occasionally used the British Mark III Valentine tank as a DD tank as well. However, the tank was much less fitted for it in comparison to the Sherman. Aside from landings on the Italian beaches, the Valentine tank was mainly used during training missions. And its counterpart, the Sherman, certainly landed on Normandy. To be more specific, the DD tanks were destined for Omaha Beach and received the brunt of the fire. In total, 32 DD tanks were supposed to sail onto the shores from approximately 5 kilometers off the coast. For these improvised sailing vessels, each weighing between 30 and 38 tons, well, it was quite the distance. Waves reached close to 2 meters in height and, of course, the tanks suffered heavy artillery and anti-tank gun attacks. Precisely because of the expected resistance, the DD tanks crews were outfitted with Davis submerged escape apparatus, which was initially invented as an emergency escape apparatus for submarine crews. 30 of the 32 tank crews ended up using the apparatus, not always successfully. Merely two DD tanks managed to reach Omaha Beach. Elsewhere, in October 1944, during the Battle of the Scheldt in northern Belgium and the Netherlands, aside from the Buffalo amphibious vehicles, several DD tanks actually managed to get to shore after traveling over double the distance at Omaha Beach, 11 kilometers, with relative ease. Multiple other funny saw action during D-Day, though, many of them looking like a stroke of genius had devised them, or a stroke of madness. A so-called double onion was a tank with a steel fence able to position explosives onto a bunker. As you can see on the photograph, the double onion placed explosives at a decent height, up to 12 meters. It made the vehicle great for putting a dent in the outer defenses of bunkers or chipping away at the strength of walls. Krebs were M4 Sherman tanks fitted with a rotating flail consisting of a heavy metal chain able to clear paths straight through minefields. The first time Krebs were used, they were put on Matilda tanks during the Battle of El Alamein in North Africa. But soon the Sherman M4 became the tank of choice. An unforeseen but very welcome effect was that the flails could also easily cut through barbed wire. This was a crucial asset, as after the Atlantic Wall was breached, Allied soldiers often ran into massive barbed wire obstacles put up by the Germans. During the Battle of Overloan in the Netherlands, the British used crabs to make their way through rivers and minefields. Meanwhile, the crabs were happy with Churchill tanks equipped with fascines, allowing them to cross the muddy landscape. Fascines were used during the First World War as well, as this photograph from 1918 of a British Mark V tank carrying crib fascines shows. Fascines were bundles of wood or other material with the purpose of allowing vehicles to cross through rugged territory. It could merely be wet, muddy or uneven territory, but fascines were also very welcome against anti-tank ditches. Especially during rainy autumn, turning lands into marshes, these were very useful. In the photograph you're seeing, taken in 1943, a Churchill tank carrying a fascine crossing a ditch, using one in the process. It basically shows the entire way fascines were utilized. The Kennel Defense Light generally was a modified British Matilda or American M3 Grand Lee tank, with the tower fitted with an intense stroboscopic carbon arc light. It could send out blinding laser beams with such strength that the CDL was even effective during daytime. But obviously the primary function of the Kennel Defense Light was to be able to pinpoint enemy positions and target them during nighttime. Still, this secret weapon rarely saw action during the war, and even among Hobart's funnies, it was a bit of the odd one out. This is one of the funnies that did not see action during D-Day, although it was used in November that year during Operation Clipper. It looks like it comes right out of a movie. One of the most spectacular vehicles must have been the tanks outfitted with a flamethrower. These so-called crocodiles had their machine gun exchanged for a flamethrower situated in the operator's cabin. 
An armored container located within the tank contained between 500 and 1800 liters of fuel. Using strong pressure, the flamethrower could emit 90 bursts of fire a second, reaching up to 130 meters in the distance. AVREs, short for Armored Vehicle Royal Engineers, were a series of armored military engineering vehicles. They were modified to be able to launch heavy flying mortars, flying dustbins, 18 kilo heavy mortars onto enemy positions, such as bunkers. The turret of a Churchill tank was removed and in its place came a 290mm petard Spigo mortar. These vehicles were ideal for the carrying of equipment as well and were a welcome way to transport the aforementioned machines. Another purpose for it was the so-called Churchill AVRE bobbin. This vehicle carried a bit more of an advanced machine carrying a canvas roll that it was able to roll out over soggy ground so that itself and other vehicles could safely cross the difficult terrain. Beach Armored Recovery Vehicles, or, well, BARV for short, were vehicles used for amphibious landings. During the landings in Normandy, about five dozen of these modified M4A2 Sherman tanks saw action. Thanks to the bottom side of the vehicle being made waterproof, it served as a rescuer of other vehicles in sea or on the beach. It was also able to push stranded vehicles back in the sea. The vehicles used during D-Day were able to operate in up to two and a half meters deep water. Among its crew was a professional diver whose task it was to secure the tow rope to a stranded vehicle to recover it. A bit more forgotten and perhaps worthy of its own video entirely is the Allied Operation Dragoon. Hubbard's Funnies played a crucial role during that operation in August 1944. There was a landing operation in the Provence, southern France. The already weakened German forces were swiftly pushed back and important French port cities were rapidly captured. Hubbard's Funnies ended up playing a crucial role in the European battle theater until after the Allies crossed the Rhine River. Now, during that crossing of the Rhine River, the Allies ran into quite some trouble as the retreating Germans blew up every bridge they used. There was one bridge at Remagen, however, that they were too late to blow up. The Battle of Remagen was daring and spectacular, crucial in securing a passage for Allied armored divisions into the German heartlands. If you want to know more about it, there should be an end card for you to click on screen any minute now. Thank you for watching this video. If there's a topic or event you'd like to know more about, let me know your thoughts in a comment. I would also really like to thank all my patrons and channel members for their generous support. If you enjoy House of History and want to support my work, consider checking me out on Patreon. For just $1 a month, you already gain access to the exclusive Patreon series. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.